Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the official Ronnie Landis podcast show. And of course, I am your host, Ronnie Landis. I'm also the founder of the Holistic Health Mastery Certification Course. You can find more information about that at www.holistichealthmastery.com. And I'm also the author of two new books, The Inner Alchemy Youthening Program, which was actually released about a year ago, and a brand new book, The Holistic Health Mastery Program. You can find more information or possibly purchase those books on my website, which is on the show notes below, or you can simply go to Amazon.com to look those up. So let's jump into today's episode. Wow. I am so happy to finally release this episode. This is with my dear friend and colleague, Jason Andrew Robel. And what an incredible conversation we had. There's so many things that I could say about this man and this conversation in particular because it was at such a a perfect time for us to have it. We had done an interview about, I want to say, three, four years ago for a previous podcast that I had. And it was perfect to have him come back, especially because shortly after this conversation, we had spent seven days together, probably like 10 days together in Nicaragua, where I was leading a seven-day cleansing and raw food detoxification retreat, and I brought him along as a special guest. And that was an incredible experience. We talked more about the experience that we both had on that retreat, what it's like to go to an island. You know, when you're a city boy, essentially, that's one of the reasons I brought him out was because he's doing such incredible work in the world. But he had never really had an experience of detaching from the concrete jungle and going to a real jungle. So I thought that that would have been such an incredible experience and it would have just invoked so much more brilliance out of him for what he creates in the future for the benefit of humanity. And so we touch on that a little bit, and I think it's going to inspire people to consider the possibilities for traveling, to consider the possibilities for exploring this rich landscape this planet has to offer for us. But this conversation really dug into his brand new book, Eternity, And what an incredible book. During this interview, I actually was looking at the PDF copy that he sent me, and it's a beautiful visual layout. Um, I actually used a lot of his table of contents to navigate through this conversation because there was such great information in the book, great recipe ideas for increasing brain health, boosting brain function, increasing heart health increasing um, cleansing, detoxification, um, increasing libido, you know, all these really awesome things with practical recipes. And Jason is a wealth of information. I was actually impressed with how much research he's done since, you know, number, you know, like five years ago when I first met him speaking at the Longevity Conference and where he's come today. I was really, really impressed, and I learned a lot from just listening to him, and I know you're going to learn a lot too. What an incredible human being. What an incredible beacon of light for humanity and for health and for veganism and for you know the high raw food lifestyle and all the other things that he talks about. You're really going to get a lot out of this episode, and I have a feeling that you will probably be listening to this two or three times as you move on with your, uh, I want to say with your day, but you know, with on with your week or weeks to come, you can keep going about this episode or any of the episodes really, and just keep listening to them and keep getting those nuggets of inspiration to help guide you in your own health journey. So, without further ado, I want to welcome on my colleague and dear friend Jason Andrew Robel. Enjoy. Jason Robel, a.k.a. J-Ro, is a graduate of the Living Light Culinary Institute with a national certification as a professional raw food chef and instructor. An ethical vegan for two decades, he has inspired millions of people to prepare deliciously easy and satisfying plant-based cuisine. The outrageous taste of his dishes have made his recipes hands-down favorites among celebrity clients and ravenous fans alike. 
His popular YouTube channel, The J. Rowe Show, features hundreds of vegan recipes in vibrant living video logs. As the first ever celebrity vegan chef on the cooking channel, his series How to Live to 100 merged healthy vegan comfort food recipes with a humorous blend of sitcom skits and innovative animation. He is also the author of the brand new Hay House book, Eternity, which I think is just brilliant and an amazing title. So thank you so much for being on the show. Absolute pleasure, Ronnie. It's uh, it's good to connect again. I know it's been a while since we've done an interview together, but, uh, but it feels like we only saw each other yesterday in Nicaragua. So here we are again. Yeah, brother. Um, wow, what a journey it's been. And it was such an honor and just an overall pleasure to have you come out to uh, the retreat that I co-led with Grace Van Berkham in Nicaragua, my very first international retreat, um, seven-day retreat with amazing people, and to have you come into that energy field as, you know, as a spectator, um, context-wise, but you really brought a unique dynamic to the overall energy. It definitely, as a speaker who is speaking for like two and a half hours, sometimes like, you know, four hours, I don't even remember, every single day, um, having you in the audience, having you in the, the, the yoga classes and just in, you know, connecting with everybody, I felt you, like you were one of those just leaders and I felt like just a lot of, um, a lot of respect and it was an honor to share that space with you. Thank you. Likewise, brother. It was um, a much needed respite from Los Angeles and, and kind of all the madness, the glorious madness here and and I want to do more. I, I think I caught the retreat bug mm. by going out there. And and wherever else uh, the universe has in store for me to be, uh, hopefully it will be together in the future. Absolutely. I, I would love to open up our entire dialogue here by recapping on a question you had asked me um, at Kyle Cease's event. You know, we went out to lunch, you, me, and Ellie, and you stopped me on the way in and you asked me a question that I, I took a mental snapshot of because it was so profound. And, and you asked me um, something to the extent that, you know, I, I just want to ask a question. I'm kind of scared to ask this question because I think the answer, I know what the answer is, right? And you basically just asked me like, um, or you said that I'm a little nervous to to go to Hawaii or to maybe even Nicaragua only because you knew that if you went there, you might not want to leave back to the busy, busy, you know, lifestyle of L.A. that we're both intimate with. So I'd like to just open up with that for a second, if you don't mind. Sure. Absolutely. What? what um, did, yeah. What did that mean to you? You know, it's. It's interesting because I kind of feel in my life right now that there's an interesting there's an interesting polarity pulling me in two directions it seems and 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 not in a not in a chaotic or violent way but more in a curious way of do I go this way or do I go that way and is there a way I can find the balance in my existence right now and and with that question it is it is loaded with uh, nearly four decades of my experience with living in the biggest cities in the United States. So I'm, I'm approaching 40 now, and I've, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I lived in Chicago. I lived in New York City. I lived in the Bay Area. I lived in Los Angeles, and I've traveled to other you know, major cities. And after nearly four decades of that, I cannot deny that within me there is this there is this deep calling, there's a pull to reconnect with nature. Because in, in my current living situation, I'm, I'm really close to the heart of Hollywood here in Los Angeles, and there's not a ton of nature in my immediate area. Yes, there are hikes. Yes, there are parks. There are trees what, transplanted on the sidewalk. There are trees, <laughs> yes, sprouting out of the concrete. And I feel that there's, there's a, a lack of this deep, primal ancient connection with nature that my soul really is craving. And my, my, my hesitance in that comment that I made months ago to you is that I feel this pull is becoming so strong that if I come to Kauai or any of the islands or I put myself in the heart of nature, 
there's a part of me that feels like I might not want to come back out. Mm. And I'm kind of afraid of that because I'm used to being a city boy. You know, it, it's like the, the, the fear of change is quickly becoming overshadowed by my desire for change and my desire to shake things up and my desire to be barefoot in the forest and barefoot on the sand and, and, and honoring that call that I feel. Mm, yeah, I, I, the reason I felt compelled to open up with that is because I, I fully overstand the position that you have on that. And I think too, in our friendship and being, um, paralleling careers and, and, um, what comes with that in the community and the people that you connect with on this kind of level, I saw somebody who I greatly respect, admire, um, and wanted to learn from more so how a state of being that I wanted to learn more from, if anything, just the energy that you hold. And when you brought that question to me, it, it touched me in a way that I know what you're talking about. And when I left LA, after seriously burning myself out on both ends, I'm trying to become something. Mm -hmm. uh, I was running away from something to something, me leaving to go to the Big Island. And it took me through the, the cauldron, if you will, um, and alchemized me in a way that it, it transformed me. But it had to burn things away, and it was quite a journey, right? So, you know, anyways, um, I, you know, I feel that very much right now, and I really appreciate that. And I think that ultimately is something that so many people are yearning for. They know that there's innate calling inside them that's calling them to expand their heart, open up. And that's been my experience coming to uh, Hawaii. And, that, and I knew that bringing you to Nicaragua, not just because it made the, the retreat so much more incredible, but it was something I felt that I, it was almost like just a duty of some sort within me. I'm like, the first name that came to mind was, oh, Jason, this is going to mm. be the thing for him because what he's doing in the world is so paramount and it's so necessary that if I can, you know, if I can extend um, another, you know, activation key to that that person that's doing such great work, then I that makes me feel like I'm on my mission. So, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you just being that invitation and, and acknowledging that that reconnection to nature was something I, I, I really was craving on a deep level and, and still am. You know, that that taste that we experienced of of being in those healing waters and eating that healing food and, and the, the clean air and the lack of EMF signals and all that stuff. Um, you know, I, I often just think, like, I wonder how I would feel if I was in that you know, most of the time, if I chose to live in a locale like that. So it's definitely helped that seed of desire to connect with nature continue to grow for me. So thank you. Absolutely. So now where we are at this point in time, you are about to release a book that I know has been incubating and in the works for many years. And yeah, I just want to jump into that. Your your brand new book with Hay House, um, which is a monumental achievement and just a monumental – I'm looking at the PDF that you sent me and it's so beautiful. Like it actually gives me goosebumps to be honest with you as an author because – what I'm looking at is is the crystallization of a vision that I have for all my books in the future. And so um, for everyone listening, you must order this book. I don't actually say that. I don't, you know, I, I recommend people get books, but this is something I'm just looking at it and I'm like for the color therapy, for the visual aspect of it alone, um, you got to get this book. So let's, Thank you, Ronnie. Yeah. It's, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the book itself, as you mentioned, was was a crystallization of, of nearly three years of research and, and recipe development, trying to figure out in my mind how I wanted to structure all this information. That was probably the most challenging part, was, was not necessarily compiling the information or getting the recipe set, although that did require a lot of work and creativity and revision. 
the most challenging part, brother, was really figuring out how I wanted to present all of this in an easy and digestible and fun way. And I swear that the fact that it's done, you know, holding this in my hand is, it's literally a dream come true. As a child, I always wanted to be an author. I actually, as a little boy, used to go to sleep with my books. Instead of stuffed animals, I would take my favorite books to bed and curl up with them. So, so this is really a lifelong culmination of, of something I've always wanted to do, and it's just such a fantastic moment. Mm. When is the did did it actually it released right? April fifth, yeah. April, uh, oh, April fifth. Okay. Yeah, April fifth, U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And then later on in the spring, it's going to be out in India and Australia as well. So Hay House is going to continue to roll out more countries as the year goes on. Uh, but I'd say that's a pretty darn good start. <laughs> Absolutely. So, okay, looking. Well, actually, before we dive into that, let's let's do a little back uh, background um, story of how you got to this place. Why, you know, why are you so passionate about the vegan lifestyle? Um, how has it it stuck with you? By that, I mean. I can only relate to my own experience in terms of seesawing between different ideologies or different um, eating um, lifestyles, but more so the vegan lifestyle is not really just about eating, is it? It's, it's really an all-encompassing, uncom- compassionate approach to our lives in a, in a very incom- uncompassionate world, right? So I think that's what's coming up. That's what I want to explore. What got you started and what keeps you going um, with this lifestyle? Well, what got me started in my in my late teens, when I was 18 years old in 1995, was seeing my grandfather go through his second bout with cancer and, and losing that bout. And at that time, I was eating a typical standard American diet, like most 18-year-old young men. I, I didn't really care about what I was putting in my body. I had no consciousness about my food choices, my thoughts, my belief systems, none of it. I was, I was truly sleepwalking through life in, in every sense of the word. And through watching my grandfather pass away, it had this effect because it seemed that everyone's attitude around me was, oh, well, that's just what happens. You get old, you get a disease. You get cancer, you get diabetes, you get osteoporosis. It's just what happens. And something about that mindset didn't sit well with me. I thought, that doesn't, no, that doesn't make sense. That's not just what happens. (laughs) And in, in the mid 90s is really when the internet obviously came out and was accessible to you know mainstream for the first time. So I went on this voracious research crusade and I got my hands and my eyeballs and my heart around any information I could around holistic healing. And that led me down a never ending rabbit hole of which I'm still spelunking into the depths of, of you know, GMO foods and the importance of organics. And all the pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, uh, everything in our food supply. And that led me to animal agriculture and factory farming. And leading that into a sense of a connection to animal lives. And, you know, that we are, you know, slaughtering hundreds of billions of animals every year for our food supply. And what, what originally intended as this spark to take my health and my wellness in a different direction became this overarching consciousness opening to the impact of my food choices on animal life, the impact on the environment and our natural resources, including our water and our cropland. And I eventually arrived three years later at age 20, right before I turned 21, standing in my kitchen, saying to my mom, "Um, I think I'm a vegan now. (laughs) This is really weird, but it's, it's what I'm doing. And Honestly, for me, it, it just continues. The more the more research that I do and the more experimentation I do with my food choices, nearly two decades in now, I still feel incredible and energized and youthful. Uh, I feel healthier and stronger than I ever have in my life. And I do feel that I found the key because it resonates not only on a physical level and, in, and a nutritive level, but my sense of compassion in my choices affecting other beings in a positive way is such a deep, rewarding feeling inside of my spirit. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, 
I have to say that in my journey in the, the dietary world and um, everything that comes along with that, and I've definitely ranted about this on a number of podcasts, so people kind of get a little bit of that from me, but um, you know, you mentioned some key things. Uh, you know, when we think about compassion, we think about our heart's calling and um, how lifestyle um, is like a, it's like a navigational device that we use to anchor ourselves in a certain direction, I feel. And so that's come up for me many times. And that's why, even though I don't use a vegan title for myself, I'm more, you know, raw vegetarian. But regardless, it's people like you that have held on to this lifestyle and who are doing it with such vitality, who are doing it with such knowledge and you're, you're radiant, right? And your message is so fun. It's so inspiring and it's so educational at the same time. It keeps people like me kind of anchored in, um, with that same focus. Uh, so I just wanted to share that and also, um, you know, really go into this book of yours, yeah, I, I mean the book is <laughs> it's structured in a very unique way. You know, when I when I decided to take this on and I really felt the calling to put my ideas down on paper, um, I started really writing the proposal for this in early 2013. So you can see the genesis of it. I, I knew that what I wanted to do was structure it in a unique way, not the typical cookbook, which is you know appetizers, desserts, entrees breakfast, etc. But I wanted to make it a, a lifestyle guide and a resource to basic fundamental functional nutrition education from plant-based sources meets the most delicious recipes ever. So I've structured it by functional benefit chapter. So we have eat for better sex, eat for good sleep, eat for weight loss, eat for happiness and good moods, eat for more energy, eat for detox, eat for brain power, more muscle, immunity, Strong bones, great skin, strong eyesight, a healthy heart, and less stress. So there's 14 chapters, almost 400 pages, and everything's broken down into if you want to accomplish this specific physical, mental, spiritual goal in your life, here are not only the practices I recommend, here are the nutrients I want you to focus on, here are the foods that contain those nutrients, mm -hmm. and here are the recipes that contain those foods that contain those nutrients. So I've structured it in a very logical sense where this can be, again, not only a great recipe book for people to experiment with new plant-based recipes, but again, a reference material for people honing in on more specific nutrition to help them accomplish things in their life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so beautiful. I'm looking at the table of contents and that's the first thing that caught my attention um, is that I saw the way you structured it. It's all eat for this, eat for that, eat for this. And it makes it very easy to navigate. I find that when I'm reading a book, I mean, especially like a cook, a cook book, not that I, well, I don't really cook anything, so I don't really do that. But just the idea of going through a recipe book, um, you know, it doesn't always guide you to the thing that you're really trying to get to. So let's start off the way I want to, I want to dive into this with you and for everybody is to just read off a few key chapters, um, and then just kind of go into whatever comes up for you there. Well, I, I mean, I think <laughs> the reason I put the chapter that I did first is, is very strategic. Uh, eat for better sex is chapter one. Um, you know, because if, if we look at people having a healthy sex life, it definitely has to do with balanced nutrition. It has to do with cultivating a healthy sense of hormonal balance, healthy emotional states, and having an open heart where you can genuinely connect with another person, a lover. So I go into all of these and, you know, approaching it from a nutritional perspective and also a sense of you know, encountering things like depression and negative thinking and hopelessness, you know, these negative states of being can rob our body of the essential vitamins and nutrients and minerals that, that fuel our sex drive. So running low on critical nutrients like, you know, B-complex vitamins, vitamin D, having low testosterone, uh, having low selenium, these are just a few of the things that can really rob us of that sex drive. So for me, looking at really dialing in these foods that have those B vitamins and the D and boosting our testosterone and these, these functional strategies can really get us in the mood again. You know, and for me, 
this chapter in particular is is interesting because it very much correlates to the eating for muscle building chapter mm. in the sense that as I started to increase my B12 and my folate and eating Brazil nuts for selenium and weight training, which helped boost my testosterone mm. and eating more anabolic protein-rich plant foods, I noticed that not only was I feeling more energy and building more muscle, but I got really activated in a sexual sense. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing is, is, is these chapters in this book are not isolated in the sense that you're only going to achieve one thing. What you may find is that you focus on achieving one physical improvement and you're going to see improvements in other areas of your life. And I think that's the magic in this is there's o overlapping compound benefits to the strategies in here. That's so brilliant and yet so obvious, isn't it? But um, but you've connected those dots to make it obvious, and um, that's just really cool. So one of the things I wanted to jump into with you here, mm, let's go with eating for brain power. Yeah. Yeah, what you got for us there? Okay, so, you know, if we look at what's going on in our world with, you know, brain fog and, and all these, you know, things that people have going on, it's like, you know, you look at, at recent studies and they say that up to 1 million Americans deal with some symptoms of chronic brain fog or brain fatigue. 16 million people in the U.S. are living with cognitive impairment, having trouble remembering, learning things and concentrating on their tasks. You know, and we look at pharmaceuticals in terms of, bra you know, brain supplements and it's a billion-dollar industry. So, okay, we've got challenges with people focusing, remembering things, having cognition. So for me, I look to, uh, you know, things like healthy fats. I, I'm, uh, I'm going to say this as kindly as possible. Uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not a fan of a lot of these low-fat, be it vegan or whatever kind of twist people put on it, these, these ultra-low-fat diets because – if we look at the average adult human brain, it's composed of about 60% fat or so. And so if we look at eating healthy omega fatty acid rich foods, in particular, you know, DHA and EPA rich foods, you know, these are, are good for optimal function of our visual cortex, helping with our mental development. There's been a lot of research in Taiwan, um, what was it, the uh, uh, Department of Neurology at the, at the Chi Mai Medical Center did some really interesting studies looking at how these omega fatty acids play a vital role in building our brain structure and acting as messengers that are involved in the synthesis and functions of our brain neurotransmitters. So if we look at omega-3 fatty acids, that's one thing we want to focus on. Um, you know, increasing our, ta uh, our, our increase, I'm sorry, increasing our intake rather of healthy fats, things like avocados and nuts and algaes, all really healthy forms of brain building fats. Um, B12, B6, and folate are also incredibly important. B12 is one area that I think especially vegetarians and vegans need to focus on because B12 is uh, required for a process called methylation. It's a, mm -hmm. a process that all cells, including brain cells, need to thrive. So dialing in the B12 is super important for memory, for brain function. Um, and the power of, of flavonoids are, are really important as well. You know, flavonoids are uh, you know, part of many cellular processes. They're responsible for many aspects of brain function. Um, there's a researcher here in Los Angeles, actually, um, Fernando Gomez Pinilla. I think he's at, at UCLA. Um, he did some research showing that flavonoids actually play a super important role in repairing brain damage. And they do this because they, they influence how the neurons actually speak to each other, talk to each other. And increasing our levels of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds help reduce damage to brain cells. So, you know, we look at all these things that are easily obtained from plant-based sources, and we can just dial these things. And another thing that I highly recommend is people getting turmeric. Um, you know, you got to hurry for that curry, man. Um, <laughs> turmeric, uh, in, in, you know, it has this anti-inflammatory antioxidant it's called uh, curcumin, and Curcumin has been shown to boost memory, stimulate the production of new brain cells. But the thing that a lot of people are failing on and don't know, Rami, is that when you uh, take turmeric, you have to combine it with black pepper to activate its potency. So if you're taking turmeric right now and you're not throwing in a little bit of, of ground black pepper, you've got to throw it in because that's what activates its abilities. It's so funny you mentioned that, right? Because I think of the intuition of um, cultures like the Chinese medical uh, culture and also Ayurveda, and that's pretty much what they do instinctually is that they, they make turmeric 
with some kind of dish, like a curry dish, and they tend to bring in, obviously, the black pepper, but then they bring in the ghee, which is the fat. And I always thought, once I understood this concept that you're bringing up, I started thinking about, oh, maybe people would normally put spices in their food, not just to stimulate taste buds, but there was some kind of intuitive nudge knowing that, oh, this thing synergizes with this thing. Absolutely. Yeah, you talk about the healthy fats that, that, that I just mentioned in terms of brain function, you know, whether it's you know, people choosing ghee, um, you know, organic raw extra virgin coconut oil, some kind of healthy fat that continues to activate the functionality of the other ingredients. And, and from a culinary perspective, it's very exciting for me to alchemize all these ingredients and, and even throwing in, you, know, you mentioned Ayurveda, throwing in a, a legume like a, a macuna which you know increases the dopamine, has high amounts of L-dopa in it. So mm-hmm. we can learn to take these familiar recipes like a, a, a curried vegetables and toss in these superfood herbs and these superfood ingredients and just take the nutrition to a whole other level. So the books certainly and the recipes in here are structured in a way that people can make them very simply or if they want to throw in the super herbs and the superfoods, they can do that if they want to take it to the next level. Mm. Uh, I think that was so brilliantly explained. And uh, so the next one I want to jump into, ooh. Okay, how about this one? I, I want to draw a parallel because so much of the brain impairment that we see, I've been really deep into things like mercury toxicity, vaccines, and, and all that kind of thing that's a little more nuanced, um, but is actually toxicity in general and heavy metals they desheath the myelin that coats the the electrical signals in the brain and they break it down physically and what we're finding is through different ways of detoxifying the the accumulated environmental toxins in the body that actually brings brain function back so let's talk about your eating for detoxification chapter yeah th- this chapter is interesting because i i i treat it from a very general perspective. I don't go extremely deep into, say, um, uh, liver or gallbladder detox. I do mention it, but as someone who just wanted to give people a general overview, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, it's, um, you know, one of your favorite phrases, right, is nature's solution to pollution is dilution. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and doing things where we are, are structurally function, you know, functionally flushing out with as many healthy liquids as, as possible is really a cornerstone. You know, natural organic liquids of all kinds are a great way to cleanse alkalized structured water, fresh raw green juices, uh, smoothies or superfood smoothies, broths, organic teas, um, any kind of these things or any combination is really, you know, freeing up a, a huge chunk of energy that is normally required for the digestion of fiber and solid foods, which they estimate can range from anywhere to 5 to 15% of our total energy reserves. Mm -hmm. So if we're taking up 15% of our energy reserves on digestion and we're freeing that up by having a liquid diet and allowing our body to free itself of of these toxins, then we're giving ourselves a break from this task of digestion and reassigning those energy stores for detox and elimination duty. So I think the first thing is really focusing on, you know, getting the liquids, the healthy liquids in there. So my, my seasonal cleansing protocol, just a quick rundown, looks kind of like this. It's, you know, um, a minimum of 32 ounces of fresh filtered water right as soon as you wake up mm-hmm. with something to alkalize the body, whether that's organic lemon juice or apple cider vinegar. When we wake up, we're, we're in an acidic state. We want to alkalize right away. Uh, raw organic green juices, minimum 64 ounces per day. Some kind of raw anti-inflammatory juice. I, I usually like a combination of, like, say, pineapple, ginger, turmeric with some black pepper thrown in there. Um, maybe something else like like a holy basil as a super herb. I love cleansing soup broths. Like, I, I love making um, a detox broth with mineral-rich seaweeds, a variety of medicinal mushrooms like shiitake, lion's mane, or reishi. Uh, big fan of psyllium husk to support you know solid bowel movements and, and really getting those toxins out of our GI tract. A ton of water. I mean, a minimum 125 ounces per day. If you can, in your area, find a place that has far infrared sauna. Mm. Infrared sauna is amazing, in particular, for helping us eliminate through the skin heavy metals. One of the best ways to do it. Uh, dry skin brushing, tremendously beneficial for detoxing of our lymphatic system. I like using 
essential oils with a dry skin brush like eucalyptus or lavender. Um, and really making sure that if we go the route of, say, colonics or colonic hydrotherapy, that we're doing it, but also replenishing our GI tract with healthy probiotics. I've seen some interesting research on both sides of this, Ronnie. Some research studies saying you don't lose healthy flora when you do a colonic. Mm -hmm. Some I've seen that say you do lose a certain amount of healthy flora. So if we're going the route of colonic hydrotherapy during our, tea, our detox regimen, I always just like having that insurance policy and taking some healthy major strain probiotics after my colonics are done, just mm -hmm. to be on the safe side. Mm -hmm. That's that's really great insight. I've I've been back and forth with that for a while when people ask me that question, and after a while, I came to this point where I just intuitively felt like, you know what, I'm pretty sure more than not, that's not the case. But on the other end, I I didn't I had that kind of question mark, right? I was kind of like, well, everyone is going to be different ultimately, and that's one of the things that you speak to really brilliantly is that. You want to create a health assurance policy, your own health insurance policy, where you're just covering your bases regardless of the circumstance, um, and that's what I'm getting from you right now in this book. Yeah, 100%. That, that's, what, that's absolutely one of my foundational philosophies, is that if we realize the power we have to write our own story, not just the story of what we're doing in our professions and our creative life, but, but writing the story of, okay, am I giving myself the best chance possible that as I age, I'm going to be vital and mobile and youthful and vibrant and able to do the things I want to do. And, you know, one of, one of the best pieces of wisdom I, I've ever received was from uh, my 97 year old neighbor. She actually passed away last year. Um, back home in Detroit. She was my mom's next door neighbor. Her name was Ann Curry, Mrs. Curry. Uh, she, into her late 90s, was shoveling her own snow, mowing her own lawn, planting her garden every spring, taking trips to Los Angeles and Vancouver to visit her family, going to bingo twice a week and driving her car, and, and shattering this paradigm that we have of Again, this assumption that at, at, in our late 90s, we're supposed to, supposed to be these decrepit, feeble, broken down human beings. And I asked her one day, I remember going into her house, the only time I went ever into her house to have tea with her. And I said, Anne, you know, you've got, you've got 60 years on me. You've been around 60 years on this planet longer than I have. What, what are you doing? What is your secret? And she said, you know, I just don't stop doing things that I enjoy. I don't stop doing things that make me feel good. Mm. And I said, that's it? She said, yeah, that's it. I just, I like to stay busy. I like to travel and do my lawn and plant flowers and go to bingo and hang out with my friends. And this was a 97 year old woman who was activated. She was doing shit in her life. <laughs> You know, she was like, she was not chill and watching, you know, reruns for eight hours on her, on her sofa lounger. Mm. She was out in the world doing things at 97, driving her Buick like, like a bad mother, you know? And, and it was just such an eye opener, eye opener to me in the sense that her diet wasn't necessarily spectacular, but it was her attitude and her lifestyle choices and her never say die mantra of I'm going to keep doing things I love till I drop, man. And she did that. She did that up until the end. Mm. And I thought, okay, what if we take that attitude and we take that zest, that verve for life, and we combine it with empowered, conscious food and nutrition choices? Now we have a formula that if we're betting – is probably going to result in a pretty long, healthy, amazing life. And so I'm a betting man, and I'm betting on myself, and I'm betting on my knowledge and my passion, and tweaking the knobs throughout the course of my life to dial in what I hope will be a long, healthy, satisfied life. Because to me, Ronnie, it's not about the number per se. It's like, yeah, of course. Do, do I think I'm going to live to 100 years old? I absolutely do. Do I know that for sure? There are a lot of other factors, obviously, in life that we can't predict. But do I feel confident that the choices I'm making can likely lead to that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I want to read a quick paragraph I'm looking at uh, from your book. Okay. And it's in the, intro it's in the introductory. It's Eat to Live. <clears throat> mm. 
All right, as it reads in this beautiful book, Do You Eat to Live or Live to Eat? Take a moment to consider this. It's an important question. With our stressed out, crazy fast, and technology-driven modern lifestyles, it's really easy to rely on food as an emotional crutch, a best friend, or an outlet for our fears and hostilities. If you're living to eat, it may be time to reconsider your relationship to food. Huh, what a what a big one that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of motivations and reasons why people choose to put the things they do in their bodies. And one of the overarching aspects of this book is I truly feel that if people are to cultivate more sensitivity and self-awareness and through that more self-love, I I honestly believe that human beings will naturally make more conscious, loving food choices as a result of that. But I, I think it starts with our relationship to ourselves, our sense of self-worth, our sense of self-love, and thereby a relationship to our food because it's what we are designed to consume as fuel on this planet. So if we love and respect ourselves as much as most people love and respect, you know, their brand new BMW or Mercedes, which they often treat better than their own bodies, then we're going to be in a good place if we learn to love ourselves that much, as, as much as we do our material objects. <laughs> And it's crazy to say that, but I feel like that's the state of humanity right now. Absolutely. And so many of these interviews take such an interesting direction into the, the what I call the metaphysical issues that go on within us, the emotional, uh, mental, and spiritual conflicts that occur within us, the psychosomatic principles, if you will. And when I talk to people, um, I always... You know, when I coach people, I always get underneath the rug of like, okay, what do you, are you enjoying what you do in life? Do you love what you do in life? Um, How is your relationships? How do you feel as a being on this planet? Do you feel connected? Do you feel like you have a purpose? And then are you actually aligning with your purpose? You know, these things. And then, and then I piece together the, the food habits that have manifested out of each one of those questions. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's such an important thing because, you know, I think about what Dr. John D. Martini says about our value systems and how if you want to look at your habits and you want to improve your habits, it's not enough to have willpower and to just go in there, take something out, put something else in. It's actually like you have to sit down and, and write out your hierarchy of values, the things that you actually honestly value in your life. And then once you get clear on that, the manifestation of these, these improvements in your habit routines will naturally start to take form because your, your intention is set. You're not, in other words, living in an intention deficit disorder. I think that's brilliant. And, and you talk about – you know, this, this list of what we value or what we prioritize. And I think as long as people are, are sacrificing their long-term health for convenience, we are going to have a deficit. And, and I understand a lot of people have this perception that, that healthy food, let's not just say vegan, let's just say healthy food in general, is inconvenient. It takes too long to prepare or it's too expensive or it's too this or too that. But my whole thing is this. None of that's true because I have a million examples of how we can circumvent the time and the preparation steps and the cost. There are many, many resources that we can eat healthy organic food on a budget and make it quick and easy to prepare. Easily done. There there are examples in my book and also many resources on YouTube and the internet to do that. So once we face people's excuses and give them solutions, actionable solutions, then all it comes down to, okay, once you're out of excuses, let's talk about your value system. Mm. Because when it comes down to it, nothing, none of our actions or the way we do things are isolated. You know, one of my favorite quotes, I don't know who originated it, but is how you do one thing is how you do everything. Mm-hmm. And if you're slacking in your relationships in your life or you're slacking in your business or you're slacking in your health, it's no shock because one thing absolutely affects the other. And, you know, here in L.A., I, I obviously meet so many 
I guess you could say, materially successful people, quote, famous people, Mm -hmm. and for all of the money and fame and influence that they have, so many of them are not taking good care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And none of that money or fame or influence is going to do any good if you feel like absolute crap at the end of each day, because that's not sustainable, and no one can sustain that unless you're Keith Richards. It's amazing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But in all seriousness... uh, it's a value shift. And for people to say what means most to me is feeling good, feeling clear about my purpose, having a clear set of values, and having those values be reflected in all of my life choices, not just one area. So I totally resonate with what you're saying, brother. Mm, yeah, likewise. Uh, you know, I want to, um, I'm just, as, as we're talking, I'm, I'm finding myself scrolling through the pages here. Um, mm-hmm. and just getting really into it, um, actually wanting to find myself at a specific point to, to, uh, channel the flow here. But well, actually, you know what? I think I just landed on it. So one of the subjects that comes up a lot nowadays is the subject of sleep, right? And right. finding out, okay, with my lifestyle, what is the optimal range of sleep, the hours I need to sleep, when I need to sleep. I kind of look at it from a performance-based lifestyle. If I want to perform better as an entrepreneur, as a researcher, and otherwise, then I need to structure the flow of my day and night in a way that I can accommodate the necessary sleep cycles that I that I, I um, that I believe are going to be beneficial for my ultimate goal. So um, recipes for good sleep. Like what, what have you uncovered about sleep? What do you talk about in the book? And then maybe we can talk about, you know, different things that nutritionally or that the recipes you talk about, how that actually relates to somebody getting better sleep. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one thing that I think people much like healthy food choices kind of, you know, push it off to the side and say like, yeah, whatever, you know, so I'm working 12, 14 hours a day. I'll get four or five hours of sleep. Um, there are a few people I know on the planet that are doing this consistently. Yeah. Um, but when I say consistently, I've noticed that they can maybe do it for weeks at a time, and it kind of catches up to them. And, and mm-hmm. they've done – there's so much research on both sides. But it's interesting, the, the research that I specifically detail in the book – um, has shown that, you know, things like energy metabolism, you know, that the process of generating energy from our nutrients is, is significantly reduced during sleep. So, for example, you know, our body temperature and caloric demand decrease as we sleep as compared to a waking state. So the, in research, they still don't know exactly why we need sleep. That's the interesting part. No one can seem to pinpoint exactly why humans sleep. But the theories point to that when we sleep, it serves in some way to restore what is lost in our body while we're moving in our waking state. So sleep, their thinking, provides an opportunity for the body to repair, rejuvenate, restore. And that many restorative functions like muscle growth, tissue repair, protein synthesis, the release of human growth hormone, occur occur mostly, or in some cases only, during deep, deep REM sleep. Mm -hmm. So other rejuvenating aspects, we talked earlier about brain function, cognitive function, Um, You know, when we're awake, for instance, uh, the neurons in our brain produce uh, adenosine. It's a byproduct of Mm. our cell's activity. So the buildup of adenosine in our brain is thought to be one factor that leads to the perception of being tired, right? Right. So interestingly enough, when people nullify this by using caffeine, it blocks adenosine in our brain and keeps us cracked out. We block that adenosine. It's like, okay, I'm going to stay up and I'm going to pound it out till 4 a.m. But the thing is, is like this is not a sustainable thing. Because if we're constantly using stimulants to stay awake, not only is it blocking that adenosine from giving us that natural sleepy feeling to rejuvenate, but we're also potentially messing with our neurotransmitters in our brain. So sleep that we notice is tremendously important for rejuvenation. And what I've noticed is that um, certain nutrients like magnesium, is phenomenal for you know inducing slumber, relaxing our nervous system, helping us relax before bedtime. Uh, tryptophan, which is an amino acid, plays a key role in the repair of protein tissues in our brain. Tryptophan is converted to serotonin, which is a sleep-inducing chemical. Uh, melatonin is amazing; it's a sleep-inducing hormone, um, and it's secreted mainly at night. So, in in addition to the food choices, Ronnie, what I really recommend is people unplugging the EMF, right? Having at, as 
as much of a sanctuary in our bedroom as possible. No EMF, turning off the cell phone, unplugging the Wi-Fi, getting blackout shades, because that actually helps us produce more melatonin while we sleep. You know, sleeping in complete darkness without any artificial light. And I'm a big fan of wearing earplugs too, man. I've been wearing earplugs for years now to just block out any external stimulation. And these combination of external non-food factors, I think, are incredible for sleep as well. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much research on that, and you know, just from my own experience, I've I've played with all that, and I've I've kind of gone up and down. But one of the most recent things that I really made the investment to do was purchase a brand new mattress. Really? Yeah, it, it's um, from a. I did a, a number of research within the price range. I was willing to pay the shipping cost. I was willing to pay to get it to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And um, after I, I, I spent two days looking at this website, yogabed.com, which is a relatively new uh, website that uses um, yoga mat technology with with um, cutting edge mattress technology. Um, it does not off gas. I found out from them and that was the main thing. So like I'm sitting at this website, it's about $800 for a double or like a twin XL. And, uh, I just, I just pushed the button. I was like, I felt, I could feel progressively in my back. Like I've been an athlete, an elite caliber athlete, most of my, my adult or my young adult life. And I just started to realize like the compressions in the spine, the posture, how it how it folds forward from writing all the time and being at a desk, and then the lack of elongation in the spine, and I've just noticed like these little aches and pains when I was in my other bed, and I just made that decision. It felt right, and I got to say that has been the best thing ever for me, that just getting the new mattress because people don't realize – that these mattresses have metal coils in them with it, which attract um, dirty electricity, EMF pollution, um, you know, the dust in the house, little insects that I mean, it's it's dirty stuff, right? So getting that mattress was the best thing I did in that or part or that arena. Awesome. Yeah, I, I want to comment on that as well. I am um, about three years ago. Also, um, Got myself a, a organic uh, eco memory foam mattress from a Canadian company called oh. um, called. Uh, why can't I think of it right now? <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, Essentia, Essentia. And I have to tell you, you know, the same thing. It's it's like you get something that's made with high quality materials. There's no off gassing. There's no petrochemicals being exposed to your body on a nightly basis for seven, eight to ten, however long you sleep, hours a night. Mm -hmm. And you compound that over many years. That's a massive amount of chemical exposure. Also, the coils you're talking about. So I I love that you spoke to this. You know, I think it's so important that um, if we can afford it to invest in a high quality organic or consciously made mattress to have organic linens on our bed in addition to the other protocols, I've also noticed that it's been amazing for my depth of sleep at night Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's one of those like it's almost like my friend robert kassar our friend robert kassar says um booby traps right okay i I took that term because i was like oh man it is kind of like a minefield right like we do have to be aware of the subtle booby traps that are in our environment it's kind of like a choose your own adventure story and so I'm now doing that from a feng shui perspective of looking in my house and seeing when there's dirt on the floor, like, oh, that's dirty energy that's being concentrated on the floor, and that's affecting my vibration. Let me sweep the energy, right? And then, like, the bed thing was one of those things where the the hesitancy was just the mental gymnastic game of, like, well, it's, you know, $800, da 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 I can't fit another person in that bed, da da you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait. Wait a minute. Why do we have a bed in the first place? Um, But, you know, it just was that decision of saying, wait a minute. No, I'm investing in myself and knowing that what you just pointed out, you're staying in that bed for eight, maybe 10 hours of your life every day. And that creates an accumulative effect, not just in maybe the potential toxins, but in the posture, the compression of your spine, which the Chinese believe is ultimately your life force. And we don't often put our attention on that. We we often food and everything like that. But I just realized in that moment, this is an investment into the rest of my life that I, you know, unquantifiably will 
poor returns towards me. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's, it's, it's an investment. I mean, th- this is, we pay now or we pay later. <laughs> and, and to me, I just, I love that you were willing to look at the bigger picture and know that this was something you were investing in for your health, for your happiness, for your wellness. And it's going to allow you, and I always feel this way, you know, it's going to allow you to generate even more abundance as a result because you're going to be even more on your game. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. the thing with, with, with people are so willing to uh, sock money away into their 401k, sock money away into their portfolios, sock money away into whatever they sock money away into. But when it comes to investing in their health, so many people have resistance around it. And I think part of our work is to let people know, like, look, you are the greatest investment in the world, investing in yourself, whether that's continued education, uh, empowerment courses, eating healthy, getting a new mattress, uh, doing the detox four times a year, whatever it is, like the dividends are going to be exponential for investing in yourself. And I think, again, that goes back to the concept of how can we help support people in loving themselves and valuing themselves more. Mm-hmm. I feel like the, the, that emotional, spiritual component is at the core of all of this, brother. I mm-hmm. really do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally spot on. I want to ask you quickly, um, do you have a few extra minutes or or uh, 10 to 15 minutes? Because I feel the flow on this and I uh, think we can go in a few different directions. Absolutely. Let's keep going. Wonderful. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the amazing thing about not having any uh, – <laughs> sponsorship or anything that infringes upon the flow of these interviews. We can just go until we want to. So for all of you, uh, you know, there's what I'm, what I just, um, stumbled upon in your book, rise and shine elixir. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't know why exactly that popped up, but that's obviously something I'm really into. And I, I find that people that have had a food focus being a raw food or a paleo food or whatever iteration and combination of foods, you know, there's a food focus, right? But that to me, when I look at kind of like the, the hierarchy of this lifestyle, that this like super food lifestyle that we have been exposed to, it kind of goes in different branches. So you have your food as your foundation. You can't replace that with supplements or anything. That's your that's your foundation. But then I look at like superfood liquid nutrition. And then I look at like tonic herbalism and these things all all fit together. So anyways, I'm looking at this elixir, the rise and shine elixir. What what uh you know what's that all about for you? This is this is about me thinking, okay I'm not a big coffee drinker. I I will consume it from time to time because I do like the taste. However, I don't like the way the caffeine makes me feel. Uh, if you're into Ayurvedic principles, I'm, I'm a very vata constitution, so I'm very high energy to begin with. And caffeine just kind of exacerbates that vata. It makes me a little too string, you know, strung out and crazy energetically. So, you know, this liquid nutrition and these tonics, tonic herbalism, is such an amazing way to get that same energy boost, but again, in a more sustainable, balanced way. So with this, you know, I, I looked at, okay, you know, gynosema tea is such a, such a hot base for everyone to be using in their tonics. And I thought, okay, what else can I throw in here that's going to make it, you know, creamy and frothy and rich and, and not just like coffee, but almost like a, like a thick latte type of consistency. So, you know, the black sesame seeds I threw in simply because of the restorative benefits, black foods being very restorative for the kidneys, the liver, things like that. Uh, pumpkin seeds, super amazing amounts of magnesium in there. Um, the hemp seeds, 33% protein, tons of gamma linoleic acids in there. Um, the ground vanilla, the lacuma, the mesquite, all for flavor, not necessarily nutrition as much. Uh, the tocotrienol is a really great source of vitamin E, which are awesome for skin. Um, You know, I've got ashwagandha and reishi and triphala, Mm -hmm. moringa. Uh, I just wanted to put as many functional herbs, super herbs, in my in my body as possible, while still making it taste good. And really, with with tonic liquid beverages, to me, it's always like dialing in the functionality, but also thinking like, if I gave this to the average person on the street, would they think it's going to taste good? Mm -hmm. And I think this recipe accomplishes both those things. 
Yeah, it's actually I'm I'm really impressed by just the sophistication and the thought you put into a recipe like this. It's very well thought out, and um, you know I was just thinking actually to myself like. Why, why don't I go to this depth? Um, I, I do in my books a little more, but like when I'm working with a client and then I realize like, yeah, I guess it's because most of the people I actually work with are just getting into this. So I just like, it's a challenge for me at times to piece together um, all the things I want to, to put together for someone in potential recipes, um, but also like what are they going to be able to get from this interaction? Are they really going to put this all together? But what I, you know, the kind of thing I get when I read this is like, wow, this is so well thought out. It's measured um, exactly. So people have a road map. Um, so I guess I'm kind of just getting inspired from a recipe perspective from looking at this. Awesome. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And you know, this, this recipe, because it has so many super herbs and superfoods in it, it's probably one of the more, it's not complex because you throw everything in a blender and blend it, but it's definitely on the more advanced side where people would need to purchase the super herbs and the superfoods. And, and I feel like there's, there's a good balance, and I was very mindful in this book, to put in really easy recipes that people could find at their local grocery store and also other more advanced recipes that people would need to purchase these more nutritive activating ingredients. So I think there's something for everyone in here. Yeah. And then on that note, um, I just got inspired to scroll up a little bit. I just, something caught my eye. Um, here, where are you at? Hold on, everyone. I'm pulling it up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so visually appealing. I'm getting. I'm looking at your face. I'm like, wow, that's one handsome guy right there. Oh, thanks. I, I clean, clean up well. <laughs> so okay, I'm having trouble finding it, but it's basically your, um, I guess your your dietary navigation um, coding being like you have gluten free you have raw you have you know you actually lay that out incredibly well so people oh here it is yeah recipe code so mm -hmm. um so you have tr for transitional foods soy free gluten free raw food oil free and nut free let's talk about that yeah i i realize that people are dialing in the specificity of their food intake to such a degree these days that I wanted to appeal to everyone as much as I possibly could. I, I didn't want this book to be specifically an oil-free, whole food, vegan book. That's a very hot thing right now. I didn't want it to be a 100% gluten-free book, although it, it probably is 99% gluten-free if I look at the recipes. I just wanted to make sure that wherever someone is at in their journey, whether they're brand new to eating vegetarian and vegan plant-based foods, they could turn to a transitional recipe, which are great for people looking to eat burgers, veggie burgers, and pizzas, and pastas, and things that mimic the flavor and texture of things they're used to. Or if they're avoiding soy because of hormone issues or allergies or sensitivities, they can do that. Same thing with gluten. If people want to eat 100% raw, there's probably 50% raw recipes in this book. Uh, if people do want to rock the oil-free thing, we've got options in there. And more and more, we're seeing people with, with mild sensitivities to nuts or just full-blown allergies. So it's just part of the overarching mindset of wanting to make this book as user-friendly as possible, mm -hmm. that people can look at the recipe codes on uh, page 18 and reference that with whatever recipe they want to make and make sure that they can do it and that it's going to be copacetic for their body. It's so brilliant, and I, I really actually appreciate the way that you've laid this out and structured it because, as you said, it would be very easy to, you know, to pin yourself into one popular meme like, okay, well, it's going to be low-fat vegan kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't do that. You, you stuck to the vegan lifestyle, which is what you believe in, and yet you were able to create all these distinctions that – don't push anyone away. If they aren't vegan, they still can adopt more of that lifestyle through your navigation chart. Exactly. And, and this book by no means is – I didn't write it for vegans and vegetarians. Uh, you know, My intention with this book was not focusing on that sub-segment of the population. Of course, vegans and vegetarians will love this book. But 
I wanted to give this to people who, if they want to do a meatless Monday, rock on, have a recipe out of the book and experiment. If they're trying to dial in more fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, and, and have more nutritious plant foods, but not be exclusively vegan, they can do that too. So, you know, by no means is this a book for just one segment of the population. Anybody can turn and learn the nutritional information and enjoy the recipes here from time to time or every single day. <clears throat> so I tried to make it as approachable to the mainstream as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cool. Just so much awesome stuff in here. And like I said in the beginning, for everyone listening, <clears throat> If you're wondering, like, what kind of stuff does Ronnie recommend? Well, this is one of those books that I not only recommend, but I really think it should be non-negotiable. I mean, for someone like me to look at a recipe book and get so inspired to the point where, um, you know, I'm going to be creating a lot of these recipes. I'm going to be scouring this thing. I'm, like, totally ready to jump into it. So um, it's only going to do wonders for everyone out there that's really into, like, recipe books. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's being marketed as a cookbook, obviously, because it is, it is food driven. But I feel as it's as much a lifestyle guide as it is a cookbook. Although, you know, it will give me great pleasure to see people posting pictures on social media of the pages, like all stained up with like chocolate stains and, mm. and, and hollandaise sauce globbed on there. That would, that would make me feel real good, actually. <laughs> nice. Oh, Wonderful. Um, what what uh, concluding thoughts do you have? You know, I, my concluding thought is I just want people to have more fun, Ronnie. Um, I think the subject of health and healing and wellness can be often such a daunting, confusing, or serious subject. People, you know, people get so passionate and that passion can come out in judgment that passion can come out in being very deathly serious and and um taking all the fun out of eating taking all the fun out of food taking all the fun out of this journey and this experiment that we're all in which is how can i live the most optimal joyful excited long life as i possibly can because if we're, if, we're, if we're in judgment and we're being serious all the time and we're taking the fun out of it, chances are we're not going to live as long as we could if we're enjoying the process. Mm -hmm. So I just want people to like relax, have some raw ice cream, chill the F out on the couch, and enjoy your life. So this book, tonally, the way I wrote it, was like a best friend hanging out with you, just giving you some relaxed advice on how to feel better. And so I just want people to have more fun with their food and more fun with their health journey. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's what I'm just constantly trying to get people to do. It's just relax and have fun. Right on. I appreciate that. Oh, so where can everybody, um, get the book, find out more about you? So the book is on sale, as I mentioned, UK, US and Canada, uh, later on in the year, in the springtime, it's going to be in India and Australia. People can, Go to my website, jasonrobel.com, W-R-O-B-E-L.com slash eternity. That's E-A-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y. They can order there. It's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound. Uh, Target is also carrying it now, which is awesome. Um, and people can find me all over the, the Internet. I'm at jasonrobel.com, Twitter and Instagram, at jasonrobel. My YouTube channel is jasonrobeltv. And I'm also on Snapchat, which is mostly images of smoothies and cats, but no one seems to be complaining about that. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. It was totally a pleasure. Absolutely, brother. So good to be back with you. And, uh, and I'm going to be coming to Hawaii for my birthday this year, just an FYI, mm, man. When is that? July. July. Nice. Yes. Okay. So we will have to coordinate that. Yeah. Finally doing it. Finally. Yes. Yeah. Well, it sounds like perfect timing and it's going to be an amazing time. So I look forward to that and what an amazing show. Awesome, brother. Thank, thank you so much. much. My pleasure. And then for everyone out there listening, thank you guys so much for joining me and our special guest, Jason Andrew Robel, on another episode of the official Ronnie Landis podcast show. Until next time. Aloha.